you know, with our remaining time, and I, I am looking at my watch over here, my phone, uh, let's talk about COP updates and some board pearls, okay? So I put this here because when we talk about COPD, I feel like my opening statement is always don't smoke. And I do mean that, don't smoke. You know, smoking could affect almost every single organ in the body. But, uh, you know, there are other things that cause COPD. You know, whether it's going to be talking about infections, whether it's talking about pollution, whether it's talking about reactive oxygen species, they're all damaging the airway epithelium. And there are certain cells that are more associated with COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis uh, than not. Some of these cells are going to be including things like, you know, um, our neutrophils. You know, there are a lot of neutrophils over here. Uh, definitely a bigger role for CD8 cells. When we talk about asthma, we really spent more time on CD4. And, you know, when we talk about COPD, there are associations with asthma. So it's not surprising that in certain patients with COPD, you could see eosinophils. It's also not surprising people with COPD can develop fibrosis, where as scary as it may be, you'll see emphysema at the apices of a CT image, and then on the basis, you'll see honeycombing get fibrosis. So people with COPD, they do have these fibroblastic foci that results in fibrosis in the lung sometimes. So there's definitely a lot of pathways when we talk about the final damage in the lung that happens in patients with COPD. I put this here because, you know, the, uh, there's this asthma COPD overlap, you know, and specifically, you know, I know when people call overlap syndrome and the big, you know, question is, is asthma COPD overlap a unique disease and it's still the jury's out, you know, I think that, you know, does it really change your clinical management? No, but um, we just call it asthma COPD overlap. And to overly simplify it, what do I say when people ask, how can someone have both? Well. Trust me, it's scary as it is. There are people with asthma that smoke <laughs> and there are people with COPD that have allergies. So it doesn't surprise me one bit. So of course, in the asthmatic, I thought there was a nice image showing the role of the eosinophils and IgE over here. But of course, they can have cigarette smoke attacking them too. Now on this side, COPD, you could see the neutrophils and CD8 cells. And of course, they can get what? Allergies. So that I just thought it was a nice picture to show about that overlap. So let's do a question. So we have a 58 year old man is evaluated for a chronic cough. He has some occasional wheezing and shortness of breath associated with frequent stops to catch his breath when walking around one to two blocks on level ground. His medical history is notable for episodes of bronchitis uh, for which he underwent outpatient uh, treatment six months ago. All right, he's a current smoker with a 30 pack year history. On exam, vitals are normal. Examination of the lungs show mildly decreased breath sounds throughout both lung fields and occasional scattered expiratory wheezes. The remainder of the exam is normal. Spirometry shows an FEV1 of 70% predicted and a post bronchodilator FEV1 FEC ratio of 62%. Um, his modified MMRC, Medical Research Council symptom score, is 2 in addition to smoking sensation, which the following is the most appropriate management. So, you know, I think there's a bunch of different things here. This is gonna be a question to help me start talking about goal classifications and how do you classify people based upon symptoms and exacerbations as well as spirometry. So I do put this here purposely because, you know, when we talk about diagnosing COPD, this is a little more detailed than for the uh, internal medicine boards, but we do like the post bronchodilator FEV1 FEC ratio, not the pre, the post, but on the IM boards, you're not going to focus on that. Um, and the ratio is 62% of predicted, so it's less than 70, so the patient definitely has obstructive lung disease. FEV1 is 70% of predicted. So when we talk about severity, you know, stage one, gold stage one will be 80 and above, 50 to 80 is moderate, so he is moderate. And based upon this scoring system, the MMRC, which you have to memorize, which stinks, you know what I mean? Any score that's two or above, you know, puts you at letter B, B as in boy. So this is kind of a 2B. So what would you do with this patient? Would you A, do a combination of an inhaled glucocorticoid and a long acting bronchodilator? You know, does this patient need an inhaled glucocorticoid? It doesn't really sound that way just yet, you know, so I wouldn't say inhaled glucocorticoid. 
Uh, is he having repeated exacerbations where you want to use a phosphodiesterase inhibitor or something, you know, that is an oral medication when we talk about COPD uh, that will kind of uh, pre uh, help prevent exacerbations? This is going to be mainly for people with the more of the chronic bronchitis uh, type uh, phenotype when we talk about these oral phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, and so I think that would be wrong just by itself. And even if you combine it with an inhaled glucocorticoid and long-acting bronchodilator, I don't think we need to add the inhaled glucocorticoid here. Uh, Short-acting bronchodilator PRN and dual long-acting bronchodilators. Ooh, very tempting, very tempting. And pulmonary rehab. I mean, no steroid here. Everyone loves pulmonary rehab. Uh, Short-acting bronchodilator and dual long-acting. So probably a llama-llama combo. I mean, that seems really good. I like that one quite a bit. Let's see. Short acting in an as needed inhaled glucocorticoid. No, that's not going to happen there. So I would say of the choices here, I would probably pick choice C. And if people are wondering, what is this phosphodiesterase inhibitor? What's the brand name for that? We call that Dalarest. And it goes by the generic name Reflumalast. I know everyone's like, well, what is this drug he's talking about? And that, that got approval for recurrent exam to help out with recurrent exacerbations of COPD. So the answer is C. So what is the big thing? I want to talk about the gold 2023 guidelines. And the big thing with these guidelines is really aggressive use of dual lung acting bronchodilators. So that was part of the answer as well as pulmonary rehab, which is always a good choice. And using a short acting there, that was the best combinations of all the things that was picked. So let me go through how do you uh, rate severity. I think most of us are familiar with the classic one-dimensional gold spirometry stages, which basically says diagnosing COPD is the post-bronchodilator FEV1 FEC ratio less than 70% predicted, and you memorize the FEV1 for prognosis and as far as severity. If the FEV1 is greater than 80%, you think of mild, call it mild, 50 to 80 is moderate, FEV1 of 30 to 50 is severe, FEV1 less than 30% is very severe. And we did have some recommendations only based upon spirometry in the olden days. And of course, if it was mild, it was all about just using a short-acting bronchodilator. If it was moderate, just one long-acting bronchodilator. And then as you proceed to severe, well, depending on how severe you are, if you're severe controlled, well, maybe not an inhaled steroid, but if you're severe and still having exacerbations, then definitely think about an inhaled uh, glucocorticoid. And the reason why things have changed and we just don't use severities because clinically, I think many of us have patients where their FEV1 is great, but they have a lot of symptoms or the FEV1 is very poor and they have no symptoms. So that's why where these, you know, symptoms questionnaire kicks in. So we started, started using a combined assessment. So we used the gold based upon the FEV1 to talk about gold stage one, two, or three, or four. Then we do a combined assessment of a questionnaire. The two questionnaires we use are the MMRC, and the other one's called the CAT, the CAT. And then the other thing we asked about was exacerbations, because we really, really, really want to avoid people with COPD forgetting exacerbations. And based upon your you know, questionnaire, the MMRC and the CAT, and uh, talking about exacerbations, we gave you a letter. And the letters were A, B, C, D. A being the best, D being the worst. But things have changed. So here's the MMRC dyspnea scale. It goes from zero to four over here. And they ask you some questions. A score above two is going to be relevant. Here is the CAT, which stands for COPD Assessment Test. It's kind of a, a, a longer uh, test. The score goes from zero to 40. Anything above 10 is relevant. And this is the new guidelines, new guidelines for 2023. We don't call it the ABCD anymore. It's called the ABE. So the E just stands for what? Exacerbations. So if you look at this square right here, it's not going to be like four where it's going to be ABCDE. That just make up E. ABCD, it's just going to be now ABE. E is exacerbations, A, B, and E. So how do I? Uh, kind of go through this flow. Let's start off on the top left. What do you do first? You do your spirometry. We confirm the diagnosis, post bronchodilator, FE1, FEC, less than 70% predicted. We assess how bad their airflow is based on the FEV1, and that's what we have right below it. 
where it's gold stage one is going to be above 80, gold stage two, 50 to 79. I don't want to go through this again, but you, that's how you get the number. And then you're going to ask about symptoms. Symptoms are based on questionnaires, whether you use the MMRC or the CAT. And really, the one if the MMRC is above a score of 2 or the CAT above 10, that's going to be more relevant. So you go to this letter B. And of course, the big thing is exacerbations. So if someone has you know, two or more exacerbations or just one leading to hospitalization, you go right here, letter E. There's no more C and D. You go right to letter E up here. Okay, so this is how this is going to be our new way to assess patients. It's supposed to be easier. It's kind of easier. So it's A, B, and E. E is me, people having lots of exacerbations, just one lean to hospitalization.